Hi, everybody! It's Chris Coyer here. I want to uh, give a talk that I prepared to give at a couple of conferences and did get give at a couple of conferences uh, earlier in uh, 2018 here. It's called the All-Powerful Front-End Developer, uh, and we'll get into that. Spoiler alert, it's going to be a little bit about um, taking your front-end developer skills to do more, more than you maybe thought you were able to do. And it's going to, it's kind of has a lot to do with serverless technology, and we'll get into what that means uh, briefly. I kind of prepared this talk to give at an event apart, an event Apart is generously sponsoring me doing this screencast right now. They are lovely folks and put on a heck of a web conference. So uh, the URL for them is aneventapart.com. Here I am in, you know, going into summer 2018 and it's the, the season for Event Apart is kicking up because they, they don't just do one conference a year. They do, it's like a road show. They're, they do it in a whole bunch of U.S. cities um, like Boston is coming up, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Orlando, San Francisco. The ch you know, sometimes the cities stay the same year after year, and they try different cities and stuff, usually all in the United States. But I can't tell you how good of a conference this is. You know, it's single track, and you all go, and you, uh, 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 you know, here, this is a good picture, too. They have great, nice tables, and everybody gets a plug, and everybody has super fast Wi-Fi, and the lunch is super good, and the parties are catered, and, you know, there's usually extra events you can go to. It's the best conference out there, if you ask me. Uh, uh, you know, and you watch speakers with two big, nice screens present big ideas and really get you thinking about the web. There's so many big web things that have happened at uh, an event apart that kind of set the stage for our industry. And I really think it's worth going. I've attended them. I've spoken at them. And I just couldn't recommend them more. So go to aneventapart.com. And I think there's this, God, hopefully this coupon code lasts forever, but AEACP will get you a uh, hundred bucks off, whether it's one of those two day shows or a three day show. Sometimes they do uh, both depending on the city. So I'm a front end developer. I've been a front end developer for uh, 10 years ish. So, so somewhat long, but not super duper ancient. Uh, but anyway, I have lots of experience because I've really made my life and career out of it. So when I just like hearing the word front end developer, I just love it. That's how I self identify. And I like thinking and talking about that world. One one of the things I like about it is I put a I put a golden egg here because I think uh, it represents like the real thing, the meat of what we build, the actual website, the thing that users interact with, and they power the businesses, the things that we're trying to build. I feel like we're craftspeople, and there's a lot of different jobs that go into running a business, an online business, lots of different stuff going on there. But something about front-end development, the fact that we're in there writing the JavaScript and doing the layouts and making the, you know, the HTML accessible and all that stuff feels super hands-on. Uh, that, uh, in, a, in a way that I love. So there's all these other people involved, right? There's people that run the show and do the management, and there's people that do the design work and think about the UX, and there's people that just deal with the numbers, and there's people that spin up the servers and think about where the data gets stored and the format for all that, all equally valuable. Super important stuff for any business. Absolutely. Love all these people. Couldn't do it without them. But again, the front end developer people, I feel like a, a woodworker sometimes that like, I'm not going to, I don't need to, as a front end developer, I don't need to like retire and make bowls or anything because I feel like I'm, I'm hands on all the time. Yeah, we sit at our keyboard and, uh, and all that, but it feels so like we're crafting something out of nothing because we're so into the code and not just any code, but code that like it is the code that goes to the browsers that controls exactly what our users see and click on and interact with uh, feels so awesome to me. The thing is ours. We're already, just because of that, because we like make the thing, we're already very powerful. It's a really powerful role. You can totally make a career out of that. I mean, think of what we, the, all the UX is in our hands. Like, the way that people use our websites, that's us. We did that. Other people thought about it and researched it and all that, but the, but the implementation of UX is in our hands. Most of web performance these days, vitally important to how people feel and use and uh, the success of your business, that's a front-end development job. Accessibility, the implementation of accessibility is largely a front-end, if not a 100% front-end task. And of course, the execution of the design and the animations and the interactions, all that stuff, that's all our job. And that's just a part of this, of course. But our job is already, God, we have so much to consider and uh, is in our hands as front-end developers. 
And that's a career right there, for sure. If you're good at that stuff, even some of that stuff, that's a wonderful lifelong career. And I think that makes you uh, pretty hireable, especially if you can kind of present yourself well and uh, uh, and all that kind of thing. So anyway, let's say you're a front end developer, though. What does that mean exactly? Generally, it means, you know, HTML, CSS and JavaScript, that that skill set and maybe other things as well. But if you're really good at those three things, certainly you're a front end developer and that's your skill set. But sometimes it can feel limiting. Like I said, there's all these other jobs that also go into making websites. When does it stop? When are you like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I need help. I need a different specialization to go on. One of those like roadblocks is backend development. Like, I, I don't know. I just, I need like data to be structured in a certain way. And it's like, I can't think about it. I'm not trained in this. I don't know how to connect these disparate pieces of data in a way that makes sense and is scalable and, and all that kind of thing. There, or, or I like, this is a, you know, this is going to get a ton of traffic. I need to think about how this is structured on servers such that it's going to be okay. It's going to live. Not my skill set. Neither of those things are my skill set. I have no idea. I run into roadblocks all the time with that kind of thing. But the point of this talk in a way is to some way push Pushing those roadblocks back or knocking them down a little bit in that some of these skills you have, you might think you've hit a roadblock, but wait, maybe you didn't. Maybe you can take these skills and, and knock that over a little bit. So less and less true, that roadblock stuff. And some of that empowering stuff falls under the umbrella of serverless. Uh, which is a tricky and weird word. So there's a, you know, there's a caveat that I feel like has to be every time you say the word, there has to be this discussion. So apologies, I have to do it now in case you're sick of this and have heard it before. The word serverless, perhaps annoyingly or disingenuously, doesn't mean that there aren't actual web servers involved in what you're doing. There always will be servers involved. That's what the internet is. That probably will always be true. Even in a peer-to-peer -peer world, you're acting as servers in a way. So I don't know. And, you know, this will become more obvious as we go along here, but it kind of means like, yeah, okay, there's servers involved, but the word evolved, it really does actually have some meaning and, uh, and we'll get through it. You know, people used to really hate the word the cloud too. And you know, maybe you still do hate the word the cloud. I don't know. I'm not going to take that away from you, but they used to hate it so much. They made a plugin called cloud to butt. So even if you're browsing the web, you didn't even have to see the word, the cloud. It was always just replaced with my butt or the cloud replaced with my butt, which is great. We liked it so much that we made another plugin that would find, you know, more instances of the word cloud to really replace with the word but more perfectly, you know? But then, oh, you know, time goes on a little bit and we start to trim it down a little bit. We're just like, hmm, you know, there's just too many butts on the web. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to replace less of them. As a matter of fact, you know, it was it was hurting some journalists because they would write the cloud. They would have this plugin in because they think it's funny too, and and they would be writing in a text area, and unbeknownst to them, even in the text area, this plugin would replace it with but. They'd publish an article with but in it in an awkward place, oh, kind of weird. But you know, we've trimmed down this. I feel like that the hate on the word cloud is l lessened up a little because it kind of turns out it really does mean something. It means like like distributed storage of data in a way way that you kind of don't have to think about it. You've made this problem kind of someone else's. They manage the scalability and availability of servers in a way. And we kind of get that to some degree, even like, oh, you know, the photos on my phone are in the cloud because they're called it's by cloud, I guess, but it really is a cloud service. I don't really have to think about where those photos go. They just kind of get stored somewhere. And I'm pretty confident that they're redundantly, they'll, they'll just be available forever because it's become someone else's problem, not mine, which I think is cool. That somebody else's problem actually has a lot to do with serverless. Yes, we're going to totally talk about serverless. I'm not going to try to define it with some like dictionary definition right now because it's boring. And I, I, that to say, I think by the end of this, everything that we talked about, if we look at all of it together, umbrella style, that's going to be serverless. So just think everything that we talk about is going to be serverless. As I was learning about this, and I'm you know, certainly not an expert, but I've been trying to research it and pull together all the tools that are involved in the services and the ideas, I made a website called thepowerofserverless.info, which you can go to and read more about this. It's highly related to this talk. So 
One of the major ingredients of this world of serverless is a thing called cloud functions or functions as a service fast sometimes if you are reading something particularly nerdy. And the whole idea is you can write some JavaScript just independently, like a text file of JavaScript that you have, and you're gonna, you put it in the cloud. You know, so it's a, the functions just means JavaScript. The cloud means the cloud. The cloud really is a server, of course. Uh, so it lives up there. And then I can execute that JavaScript on command from a browser, from a website by hitting a specific URL. So the cloud function always has a URL that you can hit. And, you know, Ajax is involved here if you're old school or whatever. Ajax you hit that URL with an Ajax request, the JavaScript runs and just does something. And we'll look at all kinds of different possibilities for what that JavaScript could be and maybe returns something and the website uses it. So it's just, you know, a browser can run JavaScript as well, or you can hit a URL and say, hey, run that JavaScript somewhere else, run it on a server elsewhere. Uh, and do something. There's a number of reasons that you might want to do that. Of course there are reasons. Here's a reason. Let's just get into like a actual use cases because I think this will make more sense if we talk about reality instead of keeping it too abstract. Say your thing needs to send a text message. You're making like a recipe website and you want a little form on the recipe that says, hey, SMS this to yourself or SMS, miss, SMS this to your friend. Why not? Or your family or something. Hey, this looks like a delicious recipe. Okay. Boop. And it sends the, the recipe or a link to it or something. There, you, there's no like browser APIs to do this. That's just not a thing. You need some third party service to do this for you because it's just complicated. I don't even know how that particular part of it works. But I do know that there are a, a variety of services that do this. Twilio is a kind of common one. Look at this. It's a point zero zero seven five cents per message. You can send it for less than a penny. You can send an SMS message with Twilio. You sign up for an account and they give you code and APIs and SDKs or whatever it is uh, to send text messages. Let's use Twilio to implement this feature. This might even be one of those roadblock blocky kind of moments where I'm like, eh, like I got the front end skills recipe website. I can totally build you one of those. I can design the heck out of this thing. I can make it beautiful. I can think about the UX. I can implement a lot of this, but I can't do the SMS part with Twilio. I can't do that. I need some help with that. That's what we're kind of trying to erase. And this is that you can do this because, well, I did it and <laughs> I'm not particularly good at this stuff. So you can do it too. So, and the reason that we can do this ourselves isn't because Twilio is like, oh, well, we have a JavaScript API. So just use our JavaScript API from, from the client. They don't have that really. They have a JavaScript thing you can use, but it's node, it's server side, and we'll get to that. So there are a re the reason they don't have a client side only JavaScript API key or <laughs> API is because you need API keys to use Twilio, meaning a big, long secret string of stuff, or sometimes multiple strings of stuff that are unique to your account, which means that Twilio like knows how to charge you and they know that you have permission to send this SMS. It's like your keys to the kingdom of Twilio is a long string of gibberish characters and you need to protect that. If that happened client side only in the browser, like in the JavaScript that you send out with your website, you're exposing and you've lost that API key and that's dangerous because, of course, there's lots of bad people in the world and they're looking for those type of situations. They want your Twilio key because they'll use it for whatever bad guy purposes they have. And they will, for sure. I don't even know what for. Probably something <laughs> cryptocurrency related. I have no idea. But uh, uh, don't lose your API key. That's a problem. It's going to cost you money and cause you grief. So the because you can't protect your API keys client side, you've got to do something server side. Now, it doesn't always matter. It's not every API in the world has API keys. For example, here's uh, like a Flickr search demo by David Korshid, right? He's like, I'm going to use the f type in a word here. He's demonstrating some other technological concept, but then he typed in dergs and it hit the Flickr API and Flickr API returned pictures of dogs. That's wonderful. Flickr didn't need, you don't need an API key to use Flickr. So this entire thing is just happening in a pen on code pen because you didn't need to protect any API keys. So that's just the way that was. But Twilio does have them. So, you know, bad guys out there using them for evil. Got to worry about those API keys. How do you protect them? Well, use a server is the normally the way to do it. So you hit your server and the server makes the call to the API 
the API returns stuff to the server and the server returns stuff to be used on your website in some way. And that code is like typically written in like Ruby or Python or PHP or whatever, which you can't see. Like if you go to some website that's powered by PHP, you can't see the PHP code. It's not possible for you to see. That's all locked down. That all happens on the server. So putting those API keys in your PHP code protects them. They can't be seen in that way. So, but we're going to do the same thing, but with a cloud function, you know, this one of these ingredients of serverless. So this, you know, this talking to this API and these API keys are going to happen as a cloud function. So what we're not going to do is go to some, I don't know, I guess, traditional web host and try to figure out what kind of server we need here because we got to run some server side code. So let's figure it out. How many gigabytes of RAM do we need for this thing? I have no idea. Like, I have no idea on any website. I mean, maybe this is just a blind spot in my web abilities, but like knowing how much SSD storage I need and RAM and which plan I need on it is not, it's not something I want to think about. It's not something I'm skilled in. How do I know I'm, if I'm underpaying or overpaying or if this is the right move for me? It's nothing against this particular host. I don't know anything about them, but this isn't what we need right now. This is too much. It's just... It's just, I don't, I don't, I just wish this would kind of go away in a way <laughs> that I prefer, especially for some little tiny functionality like this. Um, I'd rather do it like this. So Twilio, I know, has some JavaScript that they're going to give me, Node JavaScript, server-side JavaScript code that's going to work. We're going to put that <clears throat> in the cloud, which is a server. And then our recipe website is going to be able to hit that JavaScript code to send an SMS message. Uh, so that's the plan. So that's the abstract version of it. Let's look at it uh, in reality. But first, okay, we have a recipe website. Isn't that already running on a server? Of course it is. It has to be to be a website. Why don't we use that server to run our node code and or PHP or Python or whatever and make the API call that way? Well, maybe you can. And if the server that you're running this recipe website on is already, for example, a PHP site, you probably could do it that way. But what's gaining a lot of popularity here, and as part of this whole serverless moment, is the idea that we could be using a static file host. And so what is that? You know, it's a, it's a part of this that's pretty cool, right? Think of something like GitHub pages. A lot of people have heard of that. You have a public or private GitHub repo or whatever. You can quite easily make any one of the branches on that GitHub repo be like at a URL and that it will, GitHub will serve up a full page version of those files like a website. And then you can even like map a URL to that and you have like a hosted website from one of the branches of your GitHub repo. That's super popular because it's free and it's fast and like, wow, what a cool thing that GitHub offers. It can't run any PHP or Python or Ruby or any backend language at all, Node, it can't do it. It's front end only. It's like a static file host. It'll serve up your HTML and your CSS and your JavaScript and your images, but it won't run anything backend related. So if that's going to be our recipe website, cool, fine, but how do we send the SMS then? Well, that's where the cloud functions come in. CodePen is similar. You could do all this in a pen. We will run your HTML and CSS and JavaScript and host your assets and all that stuff, but no backend languages are really available there. CodePen projects is powerful, and as it is, doesn't, doesn't do that. Netlify is a wonderful web host that works in this world that has all kinds of developer conveniences for, uh, for hosting and deploying and A-B testing and all kinds of, you know, forms. And it's just a great thing. But it, again, it's a static file host. It doesn't run any backend languages. You can take your files and put them in an Amazon S3 bucket. That's cool, inexpensive and et cetera, but it doesn't run any backend languages. All these, that's kind of a movement in the industry now is that these static file hosts are so cool and they offer a lot, but don't run any backend languages because they're so cheap, they're so fast, they're so secure, they have the front end developer kind of workflow in mind. You get HTTPS and Git and modern build processes. You get so much for using these hosts. They're just like, nah, just don't run our backend code on us. We don't want to complicate this in a way. You know, contrasting that with spinning up some other server where it's like they give you the thing and they're like, well, here's your FTP credentials. Good luck or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, 
there's so much more out there, uh, but they tend to be static file hosts. So let's do some serverless action and get this thing sending an SMS message. So here's one way, and there's many ways to do this. Here's one way. Here's a service called webtask.io. It's a lot like CodePen in that it has an editor right in it, right in the browser. So you can create kind of cloud functions um, without ever like leaving your browser. You can do it right here. They even have some data storage stuff. I'm not sure that we'll get into that. So here's the web task editor and there's a JavaScript function right in there. It's here's an empty function. This is what just kind of what they give you by default when you open up a web task. Module.exports, just kind of the node way of, of making a, a function here. And this function is designed to be hit with a URL. So it has this function has context and CB, which is callback. So the function runs and it does stuff. In this case, all it's doing is console.logging something context, which is like stuff that came from the URL. And then it calls this callback and it just sends back some data. In this case, it's sending back an object that just says like, I don't know, just barf out some, basically some JSON back to, to whoever's asking for this function. So what's cool about this is that you can run it right in web tasks. So it's one of the many cool things. So you can fake hit it with a URL and just get this thing processing, doing all the stuff that you want it to do. So you can check this out. So I'm going to post to it with some form data. So imagine where a form is like submitting and then hitting this URL with that form data. I'm just going to pass it foobar or whatever. So now I'm console.logging. There's even a console in here. So I can, as the function runs, I can be debugging it and figure out what's going on here. Uh, and then the callback runs and it shows me the response is a chunk of JSON data saying hello. And then we passed it the value that we got from the form and it responded. So can you, can you imagine this like an Ajax request out to something and it comes back with the data that you wanted? Uh, so cool. So, you know, I, that still might feel a little abstract. Let's make this real. You look through the Twilio docs. They say, hey, we have a node helper library. You just run this little bit of node code on your server and it'll send an SMS message. So I just copy and pasted this node code out of the Twilio documentation. It needs the Twilio library. In WebTask, you can just import it like that, and it will just know what to do, import Twilio from Twilio. It's not every package on NPM, but a lot of them run that way. Um, anyway, <clears throat> then you you know, you know have some data, whatever, and then you call this Twilio.rest client and give it that data. And uh, if there's an error, you know, do a different callback or whatever. But for the most part, you just hit, you know, hit Twilio and let it send that SMS message. And there's the response. I'm just, I'm just telling it, Hey, just get, just give me back Jason of whatever Twilio gives you. And then, okay. So there's another thing that's this whole API thing that I made a big deal out of web task can handle that too. I mean, in this case, we could have just put the, the API keys just right into the code here, into the JavaScript that you can see there, because this is just, you know, it's it's pretty much private on WebTask, but WebTask has some sharing stuff, and I'm not sure exactly how private everything is on WebTask. So they have this concept of secrets, which you can uh, you can create and destroy these little secrets in WebTask, and I can put my Twilio credentials in there, meaning that if anybody else happens to be looking at this JavaScript code through the web task like interface they can't see those things it protects it a little bit but no matter what like you know our website hits this url and this javascript runs nobody can see this code running it's not like javascript in the browser this is no it's javascript running on the server so they can't see this and then crucially web task gives us a url to hit to run this function. So if you know you grab that URL and you just drop it in a web browser or hit it with Ajax or whatever, it will execute this JavaScript code and return you something. So that's what we really wanted here. We wanted that URL so we can hit it and start implementing this functionality and do it from our static file host. You know, we don't need, you know, this is the only server side thing that we need. So imagine that now that we have this, we can integrate it into our recipe website with just HTML if we wanted to. We could literally have a form that posts. And that action of the form is going to be that web task URL that we just made. And there'll just be some form elements in here like, what's your telephone number? I'll just pass it a message to send in the body of the text message, yada, yada. So here's that in action. It's a form. It asks for the phone number. I typed in my own phone number. I clicked it, it returned a bunch of web tasks, returned me that big chunk of JSON. 
And I sent the SMS message. I have OS X here in iMessage, so it came right to my computer. And uh, there it is. I sent an SMS message with WebTask and CodePen and like very little work, which I think is so cool and so empowering and something that I, I didn't know that my front end developer skills uh, could do necessarily. Now, look at this big chunk of JavaScript crap there before uh, or after I submit the message. You don't, you, you could have it. Web tests say, oh, I'll redirect them to some other URL or something. It doesn't have to be just gibberish garbage here. You could have the UX there be anything that you wanted. More likely, you'll use actual AJAX to do this. You'll, you know, you'll grab that form and you'll wait till it's submitted and you'll prevent the default submit action. You'll use some AJAX library like Axios. Uh, and you'll pass it the data that you want to pass it. And then when it's successful, you'll do something like tell the user that it was successful or that it wasn't successful. That's more common, but I just think it's pretty neat that this is almost a progressive enhancement of just using that cloud function with HTML alone, which works wonderfully well on a static website. Here's that kind of just idea fleshed out a little bit more. It's a demo right on CodePen with a, the world's best oatmeal cookies recipes from my friend Jeff. And uh, uh, I put a little text this recipe to your phone number thing and you type in your phone number. It's just, it just shows that this is like a real feature on what potentially could be a real website, you know. So to some people out there, that was very simple and obvious or whatever. So thanks for listening anyway. There's probably not too much left for you in this video, but some people are like, that's pretty complicated. That wasn't, that was a little outside of my comfort zone and that's fine. Hopefully it still like opens your mind a little bit. Like this is largely just a copy and paste JavaScript kind of world with some pretty easy debugging. So I hope that, you know, you'd look at something like that and give it a shot if it came up for you. But not everything is even that complicated. There are certainly things that are uh, uh, easier than that. For example, your website, which is running on like a static file host for whatever reason, needs a web form. Uh, every site needs a form, contact forms and RSVP forms and t-shirt sales forms and blah, 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 blah. Of course you need forms. Every free website in the world has forms. You need to register for an event, something like that. Is this going to be a situation where we need to build a cloud function to protect our API keys and process the form with no JavaScript and blah, 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 blah? It could be, but not probably not in this case, mostly because this problem is as old as time on the web. Of course you need forms, and this problem has been solved uh, six ways to Sunday. There's Google Forms, which you could just integrate with basically an iframe, or Wufu, where I used to work <laughs> in, my, in my early days of that, that made forms possible and just gave you some code to integrate it wherever you wanted to. There's Typeform, there's Formstack, there's JotForm, so many of those forms that are form builders that allow you to use their service, build the form, and then put that form wherever you want. You could host it right on their site and just link to it, or you can embed it onto your own site. There's kind of a new breed of form processing tools that just say like, hey, this is really simple. This, is, this isn't this is a form builder. You bring your own form. Pass us whatever data you want. But make, make any kind of form you want in your own HTML and CSS and just point the action attribute at us and we'll process the form for you and email it to you or send it to MailChimp or Slack or Salesforce or Trello or whatever. Point the action attribute at us and we'll process it for you. That's great, again, for this whole world of serverless. So form carry does the same thing. Page clip does the same thing. Netlify has a forms attribute that you can put on forms and they'll process your form for you. Basin does the same thing. I'm sure they all have slightly different feature sets or integrations or pricing or whatever. Uh, but they all are kind of in that category of, you know, we'll process the form for you. Bring your own form, though. I typically am a fan of page builders like Wufu just because, you know, it's so much easier to just drag and drop the form you want on there. They give you some embed code. And look, at now I have a, a pen on CodePen that's fully capable of you ordering a shirt and even paying for it. Uh, with, you know, with no server side code whatsoever. It's totally handled by the service. Now, a lot of you know that. That's pretty obvious stuff. You can use a service for this kind of thing. But it, it is part of the world of serverless because it means I can use a static file host. It means that there's all kinds of server stuff happening that I didn't think about. I ceded control. You deal with this form. I don't want to. That's why I'm paying you to do it. That's right in the spirit of serverless. So 
On the power of serverless.info, the website that has to do with this talk, really, all these services are rounded up together. So if you were like, what services were the, was he talking about? Just go to this website. And it's not just forms, but it's payment things and, and where I, where do I store files and what CMSs are part of this and what are the who are the big players and that kind of thing. But speaking of payments, because we just talked about it. What if, what if payments, you know, you need to sell some stuff, sell some scarves on your website or whatever. One way to do that that's been around forever is just go to PayPal, sign up for a PayPal account, create a buy now button, which is says like, what's the product? How much does it cost? Yada, yada, yada. It gives you a little chunk of HTML that you drop on your site and you got a buy now button. Uh, Stripe is another big player in the payments world, of course, and they even have like a free checkout experience uh, that they'll give you as well. But we're going to have to talk about that a little bit. Uh, uh, Braintree is a payment provider and Authorize.net and WorldPay that takes all kinds of different currencies and stuff. There's players in this and they're all kind of usable, but, uh, but of course need to be handled mostly server side. So if you're in a static site environment, what do you do? Well, we'll have to look at them. So PayPal, checkout button, your user goes to the PayPal site and they get their scarf. They, they, has to, they have to leave the site and come back. That's kind of one of the uh, uh, consolidation or, you know, what, there's ways to use PayPal and Braintree APIs actually to PayPal. Um, to prevent that, you know, like that you can build a, a checkout flow with PayPal where they don't have to leave the site, but the easiest, simplest serverless ways to do that. Now look at this demo though. It doesn't use PayPal, it uses Stripe and it uses, in, you know, so Stripe needs server side code to process a payment, of course, right? So this is a demo by Sarah Drasner who's using Stripe and she's using Vue as well to power the front end, but it has a whole checkout process and basically runs that node code as a cloud function and uses Azure to do that, which is Microsoft's version of cloud function. So this is a view site and it's, she built in some filters and some components to uh, uh, stuff. And now she added a few things to the cart. Now here's the cart. And this is a form like BYO form that she created. She created this form herself. She's putting in the credit card number and the expiration date and the CVC and the zip code or whatever. And now this is real. She wired this up with uh, you know, a sandbox on Stripe and successfully processed that transaction through that sandbox. And that had to happen through um, an Azure function. So the front end here is Vue, the payment processor is Stripe using the Stripe APIs. Uh, and that's all happening through cloud functions hosted on Azure. So this is just one of those, this is like a serverless recipe in a way. That's how you think about serverless sometimes is, okay, I'm, I'm gonna use a static file host here. I'm gonna use these three services. I'm gonna connect them with this service. And you're kind of, you kind of piece together uh, what you need to make happen, what you need to make happen. There's all kinds of other services that build on top of those too. Like, oh, I need to, you know, take payments. I want to use Stripe, but I don't want to think about all the cloud functions and stuff. There's services that build on top of that. You want to sell, uh, you know, sell your Photoshop brushes. Well, take that file, put it on Gumroad, and then Gumroad helps you integrate it onto your site. Or you want to run an event? Great. Well, Tito can do that. You enter your Stripe information, and now they give you you know, payment forms and ways to manage the people coming to your event and all that. There's services that build on top of other services that integrate into your site. I think of this as totally part of the serverless world. So how do you, you know, how did Sarah do this? How does this, how does that checkout, that subscription that, you know, buy some scarves thing work in Stripe is that they give you some node code in their wonderful documentation that you can largely copy and paste and change for your own needs uh, uh, and put as a cloud function. Now, I mentioned that Microsoft's Azure was able to do this. And remember, we looked at WebTask, which was like a web editor for uh, uh, the cloud function. Azure has a web editor as well. So this is the Azure website and this is Sarah's Stripe handler code. Uh, and you, you know, this is some code copied, well, you know, edited from the Stripe documentation and put in here to process these payment requests as they come across from the website. Now notice that it says read only and the code is kind of grayed out. Well, they have a web editor, but it doesn't have to be edited on the web. I'm sure what would be a lot more comfortable for a lot of people is to make these functions, this code, part of a repo, part of the repo of the rest of your site. 
And so that's what Azure is doing here is saying like, oh, I see your your functions. They're coming from this branch on GitHub. When you push to that branch, I'll update this this cloud function for you. That means you have kind of a local testing environment and you can push up to Azure for for production kind of thing. Now we mentioned that Stripe has this you know, you know, the, their version of a pay, a pay button, essentially. They give you this whole uh, pop-up modal that takes email address, credit card numbers, and all that, and will process a payment. Well, that's wonderful, but what they're giving you here is UI. They're giving you a nice checkout experience that can, that, but still needs to ultimately talk to your custom back-end code. They're not giving you something that just you just copy some JavaScript, drop it onto your site, and you have a checkout form. No, you have the UI and UX of a checkout form, uh, but you still need to actually like process that request with server-side code. So how would you do that? You know, all the cloud function stuff we just looked at. Now, speaking of getting kind of free UI and UX for a checkout flow, I think this is worth mentioning is that there's this thing called the, um, the web payments API. That's a browser level API for giving you that basically that free UI and UX of checkout. So that's what this thing is here on this mobile interface is that the web payments API, a native browser thing has been triggered and it said, this is the, you know, this is a donation, it's for $55. And then the browser is on them to make this flow really nicely, that there's saved credit cards and there's saved addresses and all that stuff. That's great that web browsers are providing this because it's now it'll feel consistent and easy across websites. I go look at some shoes that I like on some websites. They're using the web payments API. Let's say I've never even been to that website before. Well, still, it's got my address. It's got my uh, credit card number. And this is all done in a really secure way, of course, that doesn't expose any of your data unnecessarily unless you're actually paying the website. You still need to be careful who you're who you're paying, but the website can't like, unless you approve it, they don't get any of this information, of course, but it makes that checkout flow so much easier. And then it's just, a, you know, you get that for free from the browser, which is so cool. Let's change gears from another another thing for a moment. Say that your website needs comments. Now, this is what's thought of as like dynamic data on a website because it can change any minute. Somebody can come to your website. They can read the article. They can have a thought, type in a comment, hit return or enter the comment. And now that the HTML of that page is kind of fundamentally changed. Not only is it the article now, but it's that comment is also there which is really, it's like structured data. It really makes sense to be structured data. Comments are born to live in a database because they have an author. They have a time that it was submitted. They have a particular piece of content that that comment goes to, to connect the comment and the con <laughs> the article and the comment. And of course it has the value of the comment itself and who knows what kind of metadata to go along with it. That's, you know, that, <laughs> that's built for a database and databases aren't super happy in static site generator world. You know, the point of a static site generator in a way is to kind of get away from databases for better or worse. So that's why a lot of people are, you know, when you need comments and you know that you need comments, your brain is probably like, well, this is a big part of the site I'm doing. I'm just going to reach for software that has comments as a first class citizen of the thing. Now, I might argue that comments aren't entirely a first class citizen in WordPress land, but it has comments as a feature. So you might reach for a WordPress site because it, you know, has a database and will kind of handle that comment thread for you. And you can get a little better UX, I think, by enabling Jetpack comments, which at least has like social login and some Ajax functionality and stuff. So that's kind of cool. Maybe that's what you'd do. You'd just reach, you know, you'd, you, you wouldn't pick a static site generator type of thing because you are going to pick some other type of CMS site builder kind of thing that offers comments as a thing. But since we're the whole point of this talk is talking about this world of serverless and static site generators and stuff, let's go down that road. So let's say you're going to use one of the really popular static site generators, Jekyll. Now we talked about, we didn't really talk about static site generators. We mostly talked about static file hosting. And those two things can kind of go hand in hand a lot. So GitHub says, you know, we'll have GitHub pages, we'll host these uh, static sites for you for free, basically. But people are like, that's great. I wish there was some software that would like build the site for me and then t and turn it into this pile of static files. And that pile of static files is what I'll put in the repo uh, to be my GitHub pages site. So Jekyll's actually from GitHub 
and it is that it's in a way as I, hopefully I think I explained it here. I'll use my own slides. It kind of says, well, websites are built from a whole bunch of content, right? Why don't you store that content in markdown files, really clean, just put the content in markdown files and put them in certain folders and name them a certain way and add metadata or whatever, but it's just their files of content. And then have some templates as well. So those markdown files get combined. The data from the markdown files gets put into templates. You know, that's kind of a nice way to do it. It's just like how, you know, in a WordPress site, there's data in a database that goes into templates. The data in this case is just a bunch of markdown files. And, those th and then Jekyll runs and it processes all that stuff together. And it puts a bunch of static files where it needs to put them to make a website. It's really cool. It's really popular. And it, it just means that like your whole website is in a is in one repo, which is kind of neat. Uh, so that's kind of the, the theory behind all static site generators in a way is, you know, keep your content in files, declare some templates, whatever you need. And, you know, th through some configuration, you know, decide what you want to do, but it'll process it into a static website, just another pile of files that are HTML and CSS and whatever. What's, you know, again, it makes your whole site in one repo. And I think that's the real kind of thing that people like about that a lot. You know what doesn't go in a repo? Databases. That structured content for that we decided is so perfect for comments doesn't work real well in a repo. You know, you can't put an SQL database in a repo. So people are like, well, I want to use Jekyll and I want to use static site hosting with my static site generator, but I want comments. So that's where things like Discuss come in. They're like, well, screw it. I'll just sign up for Discuss. Discuss gives me a little piece of JavaScript. I can take that JavaScript, put it in my Jekyll template for single articles, and boom, I have a comment thread. And that solved the comment problem for lots of people for lots of time. And that's fine. I'm not... I think that's a perfectly fine way to go, but it puts all that data on discussed servers, not your own, and, you know, whatever. There's performance issues and advertising issues and security issues and just stuff to think about. So I'm not arguing against discuss. I'm just saying let's look at a different way to do this that's maybe more a role your own. Uh, uh, speaking of site generators, there's so many of these. We just saw Jekyll, but Hugo's really popular. Gatsby's huge. Hexo, Metalsmith, Eleven T. There's lots of these things. All of them could use Discuss. They could use an alternative to Discuss because, of course, there always is one. You could drop in Facebook comments instead. You could find some open source library that's like self-hosted Discuss. And I think this one's kind of interesting because it requires Python uh, to run. I think this one is P Python, isn't it? SQL Lite, which is interesting because that could be in a repo, really. Um, but the point is it can be run serverlessly, which is pretty cool. It's like a Discuss clone that can be run serverlessly. Thus, it works in static site generators like Hugo. Yeah, it is running. This is my point. It runs in Python, which like WebTask won't run Python. And I don't know if Azure runs. Oops, hold on. I got to go backwards. But there's another big player in this world of cloud functions, which we looked at for all the, you know, the processing of Twilio or the process of... Uh, Stripe communicating with it. The, the, these cloud functions can really do anything. Those were just the two illustrations we looked at. AWS has a player in the cloud functions world called Lambda, possibly the biggest player in there. It's a little more complicated, but it's kind of the it's a big, big player in this world. It can even run Python, which is what this ISO thing did, this Discuss clone. So it's possible to even run that through. But indulge me for a moment. Here's another here's another player in this world of serverless is this thing called Firebase. Now Firebase can run cloud functions as well, but Firebase has all these other tools. It has authentication built in. So if you wanted to uh, uh, authenticate your users so they see different things or pull different data or whatever, it's got authentication built into it. Netlify does too, but Firebase is... Uh, a popular way to do authentication and it's got cloud function and it's and it's got hosting and it's got a database you can store data in firebase it's like a cloud database it's like a big chunk of json like special fancy json that you can just send up totally client side to a firebase data store like cloud storage and it, it's not only can do that but it's got a bunch of powerful features like if that data changes you can be notified it on the client side it's a way to make real-time features as well really cool tool really popular big player in this world of serverless so but let's just say oh my god it's got data storage we could store structured data in firebase like uh comment data like 
we comment authors and metadata and their comment and all that stuff. Yes, let's use Firebase as the data store. We're going to build our site on Netlify, so it's a static site host. We'll use those two things. So a comment comes in. Oh, gosh, why is my thing busted? What's after this? I managed to ruin that slide. I can just talk it out, though. And this is this is uh, uh, Phil Hawksworth has a repo that kind of goes into all this that you can spin up on your own if you want to. But I can talk through it. So let's say you have a static comment form on your website. You type in your name, you type in your comment and submit it. It, it immediately stores that data in a structured way in Firebase. And then Firebase serverlessly communicates to Slack. And Slack, you know, you get this message in Slack that's like, a new comment came in on your website. Do you want to approve it or disapprove it? And so you say, I'm going to approve it. So you approve it. And then it's, you know, then it kind of goes back into Firebase into an approved bucket. And then when your static site generator builds, yes, it can grab a bunch of data from your markdown and it processes it with the templates, but it's also fully capable of making your request to Firebase and saying, are there any comments on this article? Yes, let me put those in these templates as well uh, and builds it out. So that that's one way to do it with Firebase's storage. Netlify has storage for comment from for form data as well. So Phil Hawksworth's demo here, which is at jamstack-comments.netlify.com stores that data uh, in Netlify. It's just cool to see. It's cool to see that you can have a static site generator site and build a whole comments workflow with approving and disapproving and all that stuff uh, uh, and data storage and static site generator and all that just in that world, you know, by piecing together services. It's neat. It's, you know, you don't have to make your own judgment. Is that too complicated for me or is it perfect or what? So here's a kind of a real life demo of this cloud function stuff. And that's the website code pen itself that I work on, of course. So for example, in the pen editor on code pen, we offer a bunch of different preprocessors. Here's some preprocessors for your HTML. You can just write raw HTML. You can write in Haml or you can write in Markdown or Slim or Pug, which are preprocessors that have a special syntax, but compile to HTML. In the world of CSS, we offer the SAS variants and less and stylus and post CSS. In JavaScript, we'll run it through Babel or LiveScript or TypeScript or CoffeeScript or whatever. Those are all things we need to do. We need to take your code and process it with the code that processes these languages and return the value. What a perfect idea for a cloud function. We can have a we can write a cloud function that accepts a bunch of code, processes it, and returns it. So on AWS Lambda, that's the you know, the icon you're looking at there. Last Babel, Stylus, Pug, Post, CSS, Markdown. Those are all written in Node and thus work great on AWS Lambda. And we have individual cloud functions for them all on CodePen, and that's how we process them. Now, there's a couple of other languages, SAS, Haml, Slim, that at the moment we're running the Ruby variant of them because they're written in Ruby and we need to process them as Ruby. Ruby doesn't run on AWS Lambda. I don't know that it ever will. It's not a cloud function. We had to spin up our own Ruby server to do this, which means we have to write a little web server and write a little API to talk back and forth to it and monitor it ourselves, and, you know, make sure that it's scalable and, you know, can spin up a copy of itself if one of the server falls over and all that kind of stuff. It's not too much work. It's the business that we're in. So that's fine, but it's not nearly as, as simple and easy as, as the Lambda functions are. So then there's even another Lambda function that's just like the router for all of it. So we just ask the router like, hey, I got some code and I need to process it. Can you figure out how to do that for me, please? Even that's written in Lambda. So there's like, you can see how architecture starts to happen. We'll get into that a little bit. So these ones, they're cheap. They're easy. They're fast. They never break, <laughs> you know? It's the way to go. The ones on the right are just much harder. It's more expensive. It's a little more work. They're a little slower. They're a little more prone to breakage, you know? It just shows you that it's not just like the fact that we, you know, static site generation, for example, has nothing to do with CodePen. Nothing on CodePen is built on a, is a static file host. We run our own Ruby on Rails servers that run on a, servers that we spin up on AWS and all that stuff. But we're making use of part of the serverless world by making heavy use of cloud functions for stuff like this. So here, we'll, you know, we'll change gears again and talk about something else. 
So you're, you know, you need a, a CRM, customer, what do they call these things? <laughs> I'm losing it. Uh, you know, a place to store all your contacts, customer relation management, whatever. So you, so you say your boss comes to you and says, I need an app. I need an app and the gift baskets. I need to keep track of them. It's holiday gift basket time. We got 25 clients. I can't remember who's got a gift basket and who doesn't and what their address is and all this stuff. You got to help me out here, man. You Use your computers. Build, build an app for me to deal with this gift basket problem. And you're like, have you considered a piece of paper and a pencil? <laughs> I like to put this in here as I like to think sometimes, especially in this world of serverless, the tendency is to over-engineer it a little bit. So always be careful and think of that a little bit. If you have a really simple problem, maybe you don't need a really elaborate solution. And if you're trying to keep track of who you've sent gift baskets to and who you haven't, maybe a piece of paper is the way to go. But then your boss is like, no, 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 no. You got to use computers here. You got you to gotta help me out. You know, this. we got to get this thing on my phone, you know. <laughs> Maybe a spreadsheet could help you in a way. Uh, and spreadsheets are great too. They can be um, data storage and APIs for your app. I think that's kind of fascinating stuff. But what we're talking about here is probably building some kind of CRUD app, which is, of course, create, read, update, delete, which is the majority of all uh, web software in the world is CRUD apps. You know, they're you have structured data and you need to be able to create new things a thing being like an entry into my gift basket tracker app or a recipe into my recipe app or a blog post into my CMS or whatever. There's a thing and it has data. It could be anything. It could be a basketball player and a basketball player tracking app or a user on a social media app, whatever. Of course, I can read them like give me all the last 10 users or the last posts by the last 50 users or whatever. You can update them, meaning like I need to change my name. I need to change my address. You can change the data in these records and you can delete them. So most apps in the world are a CRUD app. Let's build our CRUD app. We need to deal with this gift, bo back <laughs> gift box situation. So we need structured data to represent uh, all the people and whether they have gift boxes or not. So here's a chunk of JSON. JSON is a great storage format for this for us for now. It's so simple, so easy to use in JavaScript. We'll have an array. The array has IDs, uh, you know, and the within each numbered object, there's a name and an email and a gift box. Fine. Now, we could put this in something like Airtable. Airtable is really cool. It's like really powerful uh, spreadsheet software, much more powerful than the spreadsheets you're used to. And it has really nice CRUD APIs for creating, reading, updating, deleting all the records in there. So that would be kind of a really cool way to go that I would certainly recommend. They also have, of course, Node API. So we could make cloud functions for all our CRUD stuff for Airtable and manage all our data that way. That would be really cool. Here's another example of that. Uh, Sarah Dresner, who works with me at CSS Tricks, was had a use case where she works with a bunch of people and they all speak all over the world. So uh, the idea was to have a kind of a CRUD app for like who's speaking where and when. So it was just trackable. And then, of course, she made this cool demo that outputs it like a spreadsheet, but you can filter it and play with it and uh, and show you this incredible like demo of you know who's speaking when, on what date, and all that type of stuff. So, of course, this is probably a view demo knowing, knowing Sarah. But the data comes from, you know, the, the important bit here is the data. You got to have the data. You have to be able to deal with and edit that data in some way. So this was built with, she, and she wrote an article about this, is the data is just JSON, like we looked at for the little gift box thing, but just a JSON file stored in GitHub. The CRUD functions are in Azure, so Azure can you know read that JSON data and update it and save it back to GitHub through their APIs. And then in this case, she used WebGL uh, for the globe thing and view for the front end kind of thing. So that demo entirely worked client side could have been static hosted for sure and all that was managed entirely through through Azure functions which is pretty cool so we talked about Firebase a little bit and how it's got oh man Firebase so cool it's got data storage and authentication and real-time data storage and there's just it's this suite of tools that's really 
powerful and cool for serverless type of work and mobile work as well. Kit Hodsden made this demo for CodePen on how to build a serverless blog. So for example, here's the demo for it. And it's just, just a, a, a pen on CodePen. The, you know, here's the blog. And each one of those boxes is an individual blog post, which is, of course, structured data. It has a date and a title and a excerpt and a full content and all that kind of thing. This is built with Firebase. So I'll click sign in and I'll sign in with my Google account, I think. And now that I'm signed in, this sign in button is going to change to say new post. And there's going to be a UI for writing a new post. And I can type in a new title and I can type in the content of that blog post and save it. And it's going to post that data and save it to Firebase. So now that's there. That's persistent data there. If I refresh the page, this page asks Firebase for the data for this blog and it makes these posts on here. So this is like we've made in a pen on CodePen a blog, <laughs> you know, and you can click on these blog posts and go to read them and we could integrate a comment workflow and all this stuff. It's just cool to see that. I think I think that maybe drives it home is like this was built on CodePen. There's no data storage on CodePen. We don't we don't have a system for saving data for you to do this kind of thing, let alone authentication. I don't know. So cool. As I was playing with this, of course, this like if our structured data is in JSON format and is stored in like Firebase or somewhere that stores J web tasks can store some JSON data for you. There's all kinds of places that will spit up your data for you as a chunk of JSON. If you're familiar with front end libraries like React, you might know that the the state of react is a chunk of json essentially so you can imagine a web app being built that's just like hey give me a bunch of data you take that data make it the state in react and now you can build your whole website from all that state your user whether they're logged in or not what their avatar is what the you know the five things chunks of data that they're interested in looking at like graphing data on this dashboard whatever those th these work together super well. A React site can totally be on a static file host. It's a server. It's a client side only thing, but it can still get data from a cloud storage service that spits up the data as JSON. It can be a CRUD app and read and write that data back and forth. It's like all this stuff works out great. I was playing around with making a little food log, and I used Firebase, and I just had structured data that allowed me to enter food and it would store itself up in Firebase. And when the page load, it would pull that data down from Firebase and, uh, and display the week of what I've eaten and all that stuff. This is a kind of app that I would have thought had a major roadblock in front of it that I couldn't do. Like I could design this, I can build it, I can think about the UX, I can, can really do a good job with this food log. But I can't do the data part. Like I need some help with that. Somebody else is going to have me help me think out where the data is going to go, how I can get access to it and all that kind of stuff. It's usually where I stopped. I'd be like, I can do all this stuff. Now somebody else can swoop in and deal with the data part. Now I don't have to. That roadblock got kicked over. I can do the data part too with learning a l only a little bit. You know, I'm still using mostly my front end skills. I'm communicating with all this stuff just with JavaScript and with a lot of copy and paste code, you know. In this case, I didn't even use any cloud functions. All the code, all of it is just right here in this code pen project. There's no cloud functions necessary for dealing with Firebase, which is kind of cool. But Firefly, you can still run cloud functions with, with Firebase as well if you need to protect API keys or do any of that stuff. Okay. Let's do another one. Notifications. And there's all kinds of different notifications, you know, but, you know, there's, there's, there's browser level ones like what do they even call them? Web notifications that are different from push notifications. I forget it all. But there's, you know, just the generic term as well. Like your site could generate an email or it could hit you in Slack or or whatever. Maybe you need some generic way to heal with um, with notifications. Now, this is a, a slide I stole from Mina Markham. She sent me this slide, but, she, you know, she's an event apart speaker as well. She had this talk that I saw that was talking about her experience working on the Hillary Clinton campaign and all this stuff. She made a pattern library called Pantsuit, which is the greatest named, of course, pattern library of all time. And when something happened on like GitHub or whatever, you'd tag a thing and you'd push to a branch through serverless stuff that would happen. It would generate a notification for Slack in a channel and it would 
blast everybody out and say, there's a new version of the design library. Here it is. Now, that's a custom message that gets programmatically sent to a Slack channel. That's a notification. So how do you how does that happen? How do you talk to Slack? Well, we'll get into that. Let's say you're making a bug tracker or something, and, and something happens, some event. Oh, no, a major bug on a website. You might, part of the design of that application might be, we need to send that to Slack. We need to generate an email. We should send an SMS message, or at least it should be configurable that users are allowed to pick which notification integrations they want. So we're devving this thing out, let's say, and we're making cloud functions and we're just getting ready to be able to send all those notifications. Again, we're kicking over that roadblock. We can do this all by ourselves as front end developers. You don't necessarily need back end work. So let's build the Slack part of it. Well, Slack has this idea of web hooks in which they give you the URL that's like, here, this, you want to send a message into Slack? Here's the URL that you hit. Please hit it with Ajax with a JSON payload of the stuff that you want that message to be. Now, of course, you're going to need API keys and all that stuff. So it's cloud cloud function time for Slack. And I'm mean, no, 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 we don't even need to get into it because you can imagine it. You know, here, what does the JSON structure look like? The, it'll be right in the Slack docs for you. Take that, you know, make sure you... <laughs> send it in that format from your web task or your Azure function or your Lambda function uh, or whatever it is. So, okay, now how do you deal email? What's like, we need to be able to send an email from our, basically our static site. You know, we want to use a cloud function to send that. Well, you're in luck. Mailgun is basically an API for sending emails. SparkPost, SendGrid, they're competitors in this world of here's an API, here's your API key, hit it, with JSON data that describes the email that you're trying to send, and we'll send it. It's the same thing. It's the same thing as hitting Twilio to send an SMS message. It's the same thing as communicating with Stripe to make a payment happen. It's the same thing as talking to Slack to send a Slack message. It's the same thing to send an email to one of these services. You need a, f a function to do it, a server-side function, which you might as well use a cloud function for, and you just get it all set up to do these things. It's just so cool. It's like all this possibility, this functional possibility that has opened up uh, just because you have a little bit of, of JavaScript ability, you know? So cloud functions, we talked about web task. We talked about Azure a bit. We talked about AWS Lambda. We talked about, you know, Google Cloud functions or Firebase functions. Just so you know, these are all kind of, they're all different, but they all have that root possibility and functionality. So just, you know, and again, that's the power of serverless.info has this stuff in there. Like, what are the services that are relevant again? And it's got all that stuff. We should talk about money a little bit. Like, what is all this cost? What's the point of this? Is, this, is it expensive to work in this way or what's going on? Well, there's this serverlesscalc.com, which is pretty neat. A um, hundred, let's just calculate. We'll give it some data. For a hundred thousand hits to a serverless function, oops. I went backwards far. For 100,000 hits to a, a function, that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of SMS messages sent, a lot of emails, but you could imagine 100,000. And each one of them took half a second to run, which is probably longer than most things like that need to run. We're just being generous here. And it needs like half a gigabyte of, of RAM as well, which is probably more than it needs by... 4x who knows i don't know that much about stuff like this but this is a lot a hundred thousand requests for a long execution time and lots of memory how much does that cost well we're looking at i don't know 50 cents <laughs> isn't that wild so you can imagine like oh i don't i send a lot more than a hundred thousand emails i send a million emails well well times it by 10 then you're looking at five dollars you know, I mean, of course, the email sending service will have its own costs or whatever, and Twilio will have its own costs, but it's just probably cheaper than spinning up a whole server and hand managing that server. Because remember, it's not just like, what does this cost to run these cloud functions? It's like, I don't need to deal with the security really of those cloud functions. I mean, I guess that's a bad one to start with because you kind of do. You need to make sure that they, they can't be abused and stuff. So you have a little bit of onus on your side, but you don't need to deal with scaling. You know, you just push the code up there and it just is this thing that works. You can hammer it or not hammer it or whatever. You're not paying for it when it's not being used. It's just magical. It's super cheap, super fast, super scalable. 
And uh, just, you know, I can't say enough about it. Pretty cool. You know, no wonder we use it at CodePen so much, huh? So we, infrastructurally, there's some things to talk about. There's our thing, the golden egg, the thing that we're building, and we, you know, we're trying to do this, deal with this notification thing. So we're using Twilio to send the SMS message, Spark Post to send emails, let's say, and, and Slack functions as well. We'll make individual cloud functions for all three of them, right? Sure, we could do that and then put the business logic for what needs to send what in our thing. Or it's probably more likely that just architecturally we'll, 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 we'll clean this up a little bit. So maybe we find some repo out there that um, doesn't just send a spark post so we're not just we're not writing our serverless function that communicates exclusively with one api this lambda mailer which is you know a serverless function thing ready to be deployed to lambda that can speak to any different uh, 30 plus different email sending services so maybe we'll use that so our infrastructure is a little cleaner so if we need to move away from one mail host to another our architecture is fine so we'll use that mailer there instead. And also probably more likely we might have some kind of router. Like so our app can just say, like, I need to send this type this message over these types of different services. So our thing can make one request out to kind of like a router saying, like, can you please deal with this? Make sure that this message gets sent to these services. And then that one talks to other serverless functions, which actually communicate with the services themselves. So this is like a baby architecture. You know, you can kind of see how this kind of gets fun to build and, and, is, and fun to think about and really is still just our basic JavaScript skills. So let's change gears oh, another time. So let's say you need to build a website in which the idea is that anybody can update it or you can hand this off to the client and they don't need to know GitHub or, you know, learn some fancy system or run command line commands or anything like that to update the website. You're trying to give them a nice, simple way that anybody can learn quickly to update this website, like a content management system of some of some case. Now, you might be like, OK, well, that's what CMSs are. I'm going to reach for a traditional CMS to do this. And of course you can. I'm not trying to talk you out of that necessarily. I'm a fan of all these CMSs. I think they all do a good job uh, um, depending on thing. You know, the, the CMS discussion is a whole different one to have another time. But none of these are, these are all database driven CMSs, right? So it doesn't particularly work on any of our static file hosts of which we talked about, God, there's so many advantages of going with a static file host. It's no wonder that people are kind of salivating to get their hands on. Uh, running a site off of those because again you get the CDN and the HTTPS and the nice deployment and the AB testing and the form handling and the authentication it's like oh we get it all for free I really want to use these tools so let's not use a traditional CMS even though I have no problem with that route and they're perfectly fine in a lot of situations and I reach for those tools all the time let's look at other solutions that are in the world of serverless again Jekyll Metalsmith 11T Hugo, Gatsby, Middleman, Hexo, static site generators, too nerdy, you know, uh, uh, for the for the for the random person. You can't really none of those are going to work unless somebody builds like some abstraction tool on top of that. They could still, you know, use those tools, but have build some kind of editing layer on top of that. I've seen that before. Like, want to use a static site generator? Well, here's a CMS for that static site generator, uh, which is weird. These are some old school ones, which I kind of think are fun to look at. I don't know what the state of these are today, even though I took these screenshots not that long ago. Like, are these maintained and or what? I don't even know. But there was kind of like this idea that you could like put a special attribute on elements and then use these CMSs and it, it will kind of like make the front end editable or it would give you a back end where it found all those attributes on all your HTML elements and be like, oh, I see. They put this on an image, so they want to be able to change this image kind of thing, which I think is kind of neat. You know, I don't know how if any of these really like super took off. I think they're mostly for like kind of like landing pages or marketing pages or pretty s sites that are pretty static you know there's not like tens of thousands of sites or of pages it's more like a landing page type of stuff but for that i think it's really cool and there's a modern version of these there's this tool by leah veru mavo i think is how you call it now look at how this works i think this is really uh pretty neat i think i have a video of me doing it so here's mavo i'm gonna say get started 
and it's going to give me uh, some CSS for the kind of admin interface of itself and some JavaScript to make it run. So I'm just going to, I just found a, a pen that I liked. It's kind of a card UI that obviously has some content in it. Uh, and I'm going to drop in there some attributes that it suggests I need f to make Mavo work. It's saying, like, what's the application? You put that on the parent element. What kind of storage are you going to use? And, and that type of thing. And now find, you know, the HTML bits that you're kind of hoping to edit. So I'll just say, just give, give me the H2 here. I want to be able to edit the H2 and give it a property name that I'm just kind of making up here. And notice that gray bar got added on the top there. That's Mavo. So I've clicked edit. Now I'm editing. And now I can change the title of this content with, you know, right in the pen itself. Hit save. And now what's cool here is I can even fork this pen, which is going to reload the entire page. And look at my, my content is there. It's ready to go. The data persisted even across a page refresh. Now, in this case, it was happening through local storage on codepen.io. So in the store, if, if I shared this URL with you right now, you'd see the old title, not the new title, because that local storage is only for, you know, whatever, the, this particular browser and this session before it's cleared and that type of thing. So it's cool that it works with local storage, but Mavo, that's just like to get started and get going and to get working. Mavo has all kinds of different export targets, including things like Dropbox. You can have this data get sent up to your Dropbox or to a Git repo or to these kind of modern places to store data, meaning that it's not just local storage. That's really where the content for this site is. So it's just a really nice UI for making editable sites possible. And it's just an open source project. You know, it doesn't cost you anything to use. What a cool idea. So here's another whole concept that's related to this world of serverless. That's kind of a new idea in a way. So there's, if we think of like a regular CMS, let's just think of WordPress. You install it, it's PHP and MySQL and Apache and whatever. And you like log in to the back end of WordPress and you write a post and you say, this is my post, content, 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 publish. It publishes, you go look at the front of the site and that's how it's designed so that that post is right there and you're looking at it and you're like, wow, cool, I did it. So what you're looking at when you when you hit publish and then you go look at the front of the site, that's what you maybe would call the head of the site. Like there's like WordPress themes. Those themes are the head of the site. So WordPress is not only like the back end where you manage the site and change all the settings and manage all the content and deal with plugins and all that stuff, but it's a front end too. There's themes that are built to digest and deal with all that data. So what if you had a CMS that didn't have that front end at all? There were no themes for this CMS, none at all. It doesn't even have a front end. You can't like communicate with it in that way. There's no head. It's a headless CMS. It's it's like WordPress with no themes. It's just that back end only. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? So wh what's the point of that is like, well, you can still get the content out though. It just delivers that content through APIs. So the whole idea is there's this, you know, there's a back end and you're writing posts and publishing them and dealing doing all the stuff a CMS can do, but it only just makes that content available through APIs, like a chunk of JSON data, that a chunk of JSON data that you, for example, could digest in your view app or your angular app or your react app or your mobile app or your traditional web, your, even your Ruby on rails app, whatever. So the idea is that you build that theme, you, well, you build whatever you're building your mobile app to digest these APIs. And it's totally separated from the CMS itself. You can up, you can iterate on and update and play with the CMS all you want. And the front ends of your things just digest those APIs. They're totally separated, which is, I don't know, pretty cool. And it works pretty well with the serverless world in a way. And WordPress is not left out of this. You don't need to use WordPress themes as it were. There's a thing called the REST API that ships with WordPress now. You hit certain URLs and it barfs out a bunch of JSON data and, you know, with the posts and the metadata and all that stuff. And there's all kinds of endpoints for all kinds of different content in WordPress. It's pretty cool. There's a bunch of JSON data. You can imagine a React app that, you know, asks for that data and then 
renders itself with a bunch of blog posts or whatever. In this case, it's you know hitting that URL and using a blog post component to return a whatever. You know, you get it. Well, there's all kind. You know, there's there's yeah, but then you still need to spin up your and host your own WordPress. And I think there's like services already starting to exist that will just run a WordPress instance for you, but just, you know, on their site because you intend to just use the API only. But you can do it however you want. And there's a bunch of headless CMSs out there that are kind of ready to just, you know, you use their website to to CMS yourself and then and then, you know, ask their service. Their service provides APIs for your data. So Kentico Cloud, Contentful, Butter CMS kind of work in this way. Like use our CMS and then build your front end on top of us. You know, we'll we'll serve you up those APIs, which is pretty cool because it's, you know, it makes like the speed and security and then all that stuff of those APIs their problem, which is cool. So while we've talked a whole lot, let's talk, let's let's kind of wrap up this, this serverless idea. For one thing, it's not all in. You know, it reminds me of the, you know, we looked at, a bunch of different things and then we looked at like the, the firebase blog and it was like w- one of the cool things about that is it didn't even use cloud functions the first thing we talked about is cloud functions and how protecting api keys and in and, and hitting those cloud functions to do processing that's how codepen does a lot of its pre-processing for example that's cool but then that blog demo didn't use any cloud functions at all it just used like cloud storage in a way and then you can imagine a site that's built on a static site generator, and all it does is have a contact form that's processed by another third party. All those, all of those three things are very different, and they just piecemealed a few concepts of serverless together. It's not like if you go serverless, you have to pick every single thing that is under the serverless umbrella. You can kind of pick and choose the things that make sense for any particular scenario. You can even use a combination of absolutely not serverless things and serverless things, like how CodePen is a Ruby on Rails app, but we use little pieces of serverless because they make sense cost-wise and scaling-wise and, and whatnot. So it's not an all-in thing. Just pick and choose what you need sometimes. There's not any, you know, per type of website or size of website that makes sense to use this. You can use this for little tiny things, like my little tiny recipe thing that you can type in a, a a phone number and get a recipe from. That's just a tiny little tiny tiny demo, but it's still affordable. It didn't cost me much money to do. I might as well still do it that way because it worked out just fine. And it kind of that numbers still work on like super large scale type of stuff. It can still be the most cost effective way to go. There's no size prescription of what makes sense for serverless. There's no type of website like blogs work great. Sure. But you can build an app like environment that way or a publication or run a university site or a social media site, whatever. All these types of site can make use of bits of serverless technologies. There's not some type of website that just can't use it at all, you know? And it can kind of layer up, you know, like you can have a static site, just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's kind of static and serverless as it is. You can add APIs to that. We're already, we haven't even said the word jam stack yet, but that factors into all this, of course, well, meaning JavaScript, APIs, and markup, which is basically what we have here, you know, just you have a static site, but you hit APIs for some data, you know, grab some of that JSON data, connect to your cloud storage, you know, use a service, you know, we didn't talk about these either, but part of serverless, you could have, you could have, um, deal with your media, like your images and your video that can be part of your cloud solution for, well, of course, cloud functions, you know, you can start with certain things and and build for what you need. Now, performance is a part of this serverless world as well, which I think is cool. So let's say you, you know, on any given website, they generally say 80, 20, right? Like most of web performance is a front end concern how many resources are being loaded how optimized are they in what you know in what way are they being loaded such that they block and don't block and you know what's the experience of loading a lot of that stuff is solely in the hands of front end developers that they say 80% of that work on the speed and feel of a website is a front end thing but of course if documents are coming back super slowly that's a back end concern. And usually that's maybe 20% of the world, but that's a sucky 20%, especially if you're having a problem with it, because especially as a front end developer, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how to fix that. You know, that's just not my, I don't know how to deal with that. You know, whereas if it's in a serverless world, you've punted that problem to somebody else. Now it's their problem. They're incentivized to make that fast and secure and easy. And just, you know, of course I want to use them because they eliminate that that 20% worry. 
there's some security stuff like, you know, let's say I, you know, I've, I've, I've bought my own hosting and I've spun up my own site that's got a database on it. Like, what do I need to know to protect that? What's the checklist for protecting that database? File permissions wise, login wise, like how it, the front end connects to that database. Is that stuff secure enough? I don't know. I can research it and I can use accumulated knowledge over the years of things I've screwed up, but I don't really know. I don't fundamentally know as a front end developer developer how to really protect a database. Now, my WordPress databases, I, I use Jetpack and have them back up for me. So I'm not wor- that much worried about backup, but I'm just using some service. I don't fundamentally understand it. Oh my God, what file permissions should all these backend files be? Oh, I don't know. Where do I keep all the, my secret connect server connection information? Like how, how do bad guys operate? Like how do they breach a website? What do I really need to worry about? Uh, uh, all this, the you know, all this stuff as a front end developer to me is very like scary. Maybe I'm just this list is just me speaking for myself, but I'm scared of lots of stuff that can go wrong that I have no domain expertise in. And it's kind of one of those reasons why when I go to a static file host, I the, the like aside from workflow and HTTPS and CDN and all these other advantages that they give me. There's this other mini bonus of like, oh, I don't have to worry about file permissions. I don't have to worry about anybody breaking into this server. You, you get this like security benefit of just like, well, oh, that feels good. Don't have to worry about any of that stuff. It's kind of like letting another company specialize and deal with something for me. So f- for so many years, we've trusted a form processing company or we're trusting our server host anyway. It's kind of like leveling up what we trust another company to do for us. And sometimes the serverless step is one too far for some people. So they don't like it for some reason. Uh, uh, But we tend to step up this ladder. You know, a lot of us don't run our own hardware. That's infrastructure as a service. This is another Sarah Dresner demo. And then we trust other companies to put software and operating systems and stuff on that and deal with that part of it for us. Or we trust another company to, you know, handle our data for us. And it's, it just gets to the point where, like, let's trust other companies who specialize in these things to deal with this as we kind of lay, sink the iceberg a little bit. And it's just kind of the application itself that, that, we, that we write mostly and trust most of it else to other people. So it's not like serverless is 100% better all the time for everything, no matter what, period. I just think it's cool. I just like to observe it. I just like to like know what's going on in our industry because I'm certainly not the one pushing this stuff forward so much. I'm mostly just watching it happen and watching myself be able to knock down barriers I didn't know that I could knock down, which is pretty cool. And just knowing that this is happening, just feeding this into your brain is valuable so that you know when situations like this come up, what you can and can't do and what's possible. Again, the website is thepowerofserverless.info has a lot of these ideas and all and probably the biggest flushed out section on the site is services where it talks about like, let's say I need to send an email. What are the services that do that? What are the CM relevant CMSs? All that's there on the power of serverless.info. I'm Chris Coyer. Uh, 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 the talk was a, all powerful front end developer. And again, this was sponsored by, and thanks so much to, and given as a talk first at an event apart.com. Um, coming up, there's a bunch of different shows in 2018, but if you're listening to this even later than that, of course, they'll be coming to new cities in 2019 and 20 and 21, and it's going to be awesome. I hope to see you there. Bye-bye, everybody.